Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor uh, that, you know, I got the opportunity to speak uh, and to have an interactive session uh, with the students of Vidyapit. I am thankful to our Secretary Maharaj. I am especially thankful to Praktani. So, you know, this is where, this is where we were. Can you bring that, my first slide again? This is where we were. This is in front of Brahmananda Dham in 1970 with my friends. Some of them are sitting here. And in the middle, you see Sami Shuddha Satyanandaji, Krishna Maharaj, and the little circled one is me, hmm? like some of you. So, Shuddha Satyanandaji, Krishna Maharaj, hmm, upgraded Vidyapit to a high school, affiliated Vidyapit with the central board and which is playing a big role now. Vidyapit is one of the best school in India uh, and being in the central board definitely it has helped. During his time, the glorious lab you see beside the Bani Bhavan, the library, our temple, teacher's quarter, all were built. You see, Suddha Satanand is still smiling to us. Pranam Maharaj, Pranam to all monks and staffs and a very, very warm welcome to the superstar students of Vidyapit. So this is where we were and this is where you current students are. Next slide, please. This is where partly we are, uh, partly we have filled our dream, and this is where you people will be, and that's the part of the talk today. In our time, we had a wonderful teacher, his name was ABC, Amiya Bhushan Chaudhary. He used to tell us that, you know, the whole universe is little bit of chemistry and statistics. Obviously, behind everything, there has to be a thought process. No experiment happens without a hypo hypothesis. So, now I will go back to my certain things, my childhood. As I said, no hypothesis can happen without uh, no experiments can happen without a hypothesis. If you want to spin an electron around, you need a positively charged proton in the center. If you want a antibody against COVID, you need to get exposure to a COVID antigen. Next slide, please. So, this brings to my childhood. You know, when I think of my father, many of you have seen, six foot four inches high, serious, full with gravity, and you know, sweets and chocolates used to come, but never through him. Uh, it used to come through my pious mother, Billavasini Devi. But now when I remember, you know, glimpses come. Oh, once upon a time when we were little kid, he used to play with us. We used to sit around with him. He used to tell stories. And he is the first person who introduced me to Ramakrishna Dev. He told us that I'm going to tell you a wonderful story. Then he says, Thakur did not like money. He could not touch it. Narendra thought, how it is possible? Everybody is running after money. Huh? So what he did, hidingly, he put few coins under his sitting mattress. Thakur comes and jumps out with a burning sensation. And then he looks behind and he sees surprising eyes of Narendranath. Thakur did not scold him. He told him, Naren, never trust anything until you get a proof of it. Then with time I come here, I hear another wonderful story. At, at that time, the most intellectual man of India, Keshav Chandra Sen, comes to Ramakrishna Dev. And he says, Thakur, your mother, your mother Kali is three, three feet tall and how she can rule this huge universe? Thakur tells Keshav, nature is so beautiful. Let us go and take a walk along the river. 
sun was setting, beautiful sun. Then Thakur said, Hey Keshav, look at the sun. Looks like a big dinner plate. Is sun that big? Keshav says, Thakur, are you crazy? Sun is huge, huge, huge. Even you cannot imagine how big it is. Then Thakur said, Why it is so small? Then Keshav says, We are far, far away. Thakur pats his back and says, Keshav, you are far, far, far away from my mother. That's why she sings little to you. Keshav, think, 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 think more deeply. Keshav agreed to that. Next slide, please. Then you know, with time, huh, I go to medical school to learn medical, uh, medicine and science. And this is just to show to you people that once upon a time, you know, there was a telegram. We used to get our result by, by a telegram. So, we go to our medical school and then they started teaching us, you know, Sri Prasad, you have to make a hypothesis. You have to do experiments. You have to prove it. Think deeply. I was telling myself, Thakur Vidrapit has already tuned me how to progress, how to do my science. Next slide, please. So you know, I learned ABCD for growth and prospect from here. So A is alert awareness, but alert awareness with a little alarm. So look around, see what is happening and awareness with activity. Do it very sincerely and actively and that will give you the information. Huh? That will decide huh, what you like, what discipline you to go and that will create the belief, the con confidence and that motivation. And that motivation will lead to your dream and success of a dream. But you, you, you see a little circle there? Clarity of thought. That belief, that motivation has to percolate through the clarity of thought. You see, Ravan, Yudhishthir, Hitler, they had strong motivations, but their motivation led to destruction. Whether Martin Luther King, Netaji, Gandhiji, huh? their motivation percolate through the clarity of thought, goodness and value, and that gave us freedom. Madam Curie sacrificed everything, huh? her family, her friend, her life. And what did she get? What I'm hearing? Two Nobels? No, she did not give us two Nobels. She gave us two things, one radium and another radium for the cure of cancer. So, you know, next slide. You know, Samiji said one very good thing about science, that Everything, every possible thing, what you are seeing here, what is happening, you should be able to explain by science. And if you cannot explain by science, that is not failure of science. Science to be way more advanced. Now here I am telling you a story a little bit, you know. So the, this is a good, uh, we, we used to see it, Star Trek, maybe some of you have seen, you know. Uh, so aliens are coming to India and getting surprised what we are doing. Then one of the crew member, you know, got sick. And they took to the best hospital of world, uh, St. Mary's Hospital at San Francisco. I worked at San Francisco. But the captain, uh, he's not happy. He's telling, no, I don't want my colleagues to get treated by this uh, people, doctors of the earth. They practice medieval medicine. So hidingly, he goes inside the hospital. Even hidingly, he goes inside the operation theater. And, you know, he's doing that. While going, he's seeing, you know, few patients are standing in the line. He asks them, what do you need? Dialysis. So, you know, dialysis is done for kidney failure. Oh, you were doing dialysis? That's a medieval prayer treatment. And then he gives them pills. But anyway, he's successful. His friends got treated. And now he's escaping. And then he's hearing. Some of the people are saying, hey, one doctor gave us pill. And my kidney has started growing already. So, you know, that was a fiction, mid-80s. Huh? Within 35 years, huh? now we can grow more, almost we are in that stage, we will be able to grow any organ we want. Next slide, please. 
so you know in next few slides you know maharaj suggested to tell you that you know how science is interesting what kind of science we do so you know what is inflammation when a insect bites huh? it gets swollen it gets warm it gets red so there must be a lot of energy where from that energy is coming so there is a white blood cells huh? they come to counter the uh, insect agent my right so to counter that they have to be more active and anything active in the body will need more glucose so a lady you know our scientist she is sitting here she came out with the idea that they are using more glucose so if i tag the glucose with a radioactive agent then that glucose will go inside the cell and we can measure radioactivity so then we should be able to measure inflammation and here just a simple example if you see that mouse you see day zero hmm, and with time how the mouse foot is getting swollen so that is inflammation and those are 11 12 you know what is histology you can see some blue cells are coming those are the white blood cells huh? and if you see the last one the glowing that's the imaging pet imaging so that glowing part we can quantify we can quantify inflammation now little more if you see the bar diagram you see x axis and y axis huh? in the x axis is the time with time and y axis are the measures you see the measures are going up so we can quantitatively measure inflammation by a simple thought go to the next slide and that we are the first now we can see the inflammation in human you can see these two hands and those glowing things are inflammation are from arthritis inflammation can happen next slide please so another example what kind of science we do we make medicine so there is a condition in skin called psoriasis where the skin cells you know grows very fast so we found a medicine an antibody to kill those cells hmm. but we have to prove it by doing animal experiments because if we cannot give that medicine to human that may have side effects we don't know efficacy now if we do experiment in mouse then we will know what is happening to mouse and mouse simple system is very simple we will not know everything so we came out with an idea so on the on the right side on your left side you see that's the human so human psoriasis we took it out and the bottom we put it on a mouse now if you put it in a mouse you know if you give wrong blood to a person there will be reaction that person will die because of the immune system so we have to reduce the immune system of the mouse so we have to do two novel work one make the medicine then another novelty huh? make a mouse huh, which not reject and then if you see the third slide the test tube things are coming so those are the skin cells they grow deep and they cause the disease and when we treat out with antibody now this is a mouse a human skin see those test tube things are gone that's how we make medicine next slide please but you know nothing will happen without simplicity honesty and dignity and that's where you know our respected sharuda comes he taught generation and generations of students those who go went back to the society and led our country see his simplicity you know in 1994 huh? so very old man 20 years we have left vidyapeet we gave him a small award a teaching award and he is writing to my elder brother devi prasad see his simplicity uh, that i got 15000 i have never seen 15000 ever in my eyes see his simplicity who has created uh, hundreds of doctors engineers science business people has never seen 1500 of money uh, he doesn't care about that 1500 money and then he does not know how to spend it but immediately makes a solution that he is going to spend it for homeopathy hmm, and help more people hmm. next slide please next slide See, you know, when I think of Charuda, you know, I think about these few lines. Nitya kale rutsabotavo vishero dipalika ami shudutar mati pradeep jala otahar shika. This is Tagore's line. Tagore is saying, hey Lord, every day you celebrate by igniting stars and superstars. Why don't you please ignite a little lamp of enlightenment within me? Next slide, please. And you know, that's exactly Vidyapit does. Vidyapit ignites enlightenment for education, values, hard work, and creativity. With this, you know, 
I feel fortunate I have been here and I want to finish my talk and I hope Brutada uh, you are there with your dhoti and Punjabi beside Samudra and La La Lalda in, in between there and this was one of the picture of our time. See how small Vidya Pitu family was. That's all teacher we had. Huh? So Vidya Pit is a ever flowing river of sweet nectar which gives, which helps and which gives happiness. Bahujana hitaya, bahujana shukhaya amrita bahini. With that I end and then I introduced my second speaker Bhavani Prasad Rai Chudri. He is an alumni of IIT Kanpur and Stanford but first, very first, he is an alumni of Devgar Vidyapit. Thank you. Round of applause for Dr. Siva Prasad Rai Chaudhuri, my brother, you know, my middle brother, my elder brother is also here. And uh, about Dr. Rai Chaudhuri, Sibu, Sibu Prasad, right? Um, he is um, a consummate teacher. So when I was young, he would teach me all the time. You know, the education system, the students, I know there are few of you, but I need your attention. Okay? Do I hear attention from the students? Okay. So, um, Um, I wanted to start with a song, with a hymn of, to Sri Ramakrishna. He is the reason we are all here. However, um, in this lifetime, if music was the currency of education, I would be a backbencher and a high school dropout. So, but for the next life, I have a boon, Tathastu, from revered Swami Suvitanandaji Maharaj, that I will have good musical skills. So in this life, first, I'm going to outsource, you know, um, so, So, at this point, you know, I didn't have many talents growing up in Vidapit. But one thing that I figured out late into my Vidapit life, like I joined in class four in 1969, and by around class seven or eight, I realized that I could shout. So many a times I have given long speeches eloquence, debate, recitation, and on occasions I would be the speaker because I could shout, right? So I thought I would resurrect my old self, okay? So what next you're going to see is resurrection of my old self. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Respected monastic members, elders, and dear brothers, this is Bhavani Ruchadhari from 1971. I am around 10 years old and I appear before you as I was on my trip to the great city of Kolkata with our teacher Nitaida and a 1975 batch student Alok Sen. I went there to take the National Merit Scholarship exam where I ranked very high and was awarded a certificate in lieu of the financial scholarship as my father's income was above the maximum limit. I've been brought back to life by an AI program that my students have created and I'm so happy that I could be here. As you can tell, my grown-up version, Professor Ruchadhri as people call him, is on the dais and he looks the part, doesn't he? I have been eagerly looking forward to meeting and addressing the young boys like me in the audience I feel fortunate to be able to do this time travel. I always have long conversations with Professor Ruchadri about how it was to be a student of Vidapit and how I grew up to be him. The ups and downs, hopes and aspirations that we went through together. One of the most compelling things I would like to share would be the uncertainties that I grew up with. I did not know if I was intelligent enough to be able to do well as an adult. I did not know what opportunities would come my way. I did not know if I was good enough, smart enough, or capable enough. I was physically not strong, and much to my dismay, I could not do well in sports. I had no natural musical talents and could not sing or play musical instruments. I was not good with my hands and could not draw paint or build things. I miss my mother badly. There was not much systematic or personalized training available to me or anyone else at the time we were students, nor was there anyone who would look at me compassionately and say, see me fail and yet not judge me. But I had this dream to do something special something extraordinary, something where I would excel. My father had openly declared to everyone, ever since I was old enough to understand anything, that his life would be a total waste. Not his children's life, but my father's own life would be a total waste if we did not win the Nobel Prize. Imagine my burden. Forget about the Nobel Prize. I could not even focus enough on studies to learn simple things. Then, Thakur happened to me. He came to my rescue. He was the only person I could talk to and pray to and complain to and cry to. Thakur was the person I opened myself to. Things changed slowly most of the time and suddenly at other times. In class eight, I found myself to be all calm and I could suddenly focus on studies. I neglected everything else and just focused. I gained in confidence and academically did very well, ending up in a virtual three-way tie for the top spot. I was fortunate and found my way to IIT Kanpur with flying colors. I had an all India rank of 50 and an Eastern Zone rank of three. Where, at IIT Kanpur, I ended up at the top of my class and then to Stanford University, where I finally found an environment that was truly empowering. And then to being a professor and many other things at the world stage. I will return towards the end of this program to greet you again and say goodbye. Now I better let my grown-up self tell you about what he thinks is awaiting you and how he thinks you can accept. Okay. So what is that called? 
deep faking, right? So this photo, and I'm going to show it to you maybe at the end, is from a photo with Nithaida and Alok Sen Gupta from 1975 batch and myself. So we took my photo out and then we kind of blended with my modern self, the current self, and we created this video. This is one of the, you know, revolutions that has happened in AI, in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And fortunately, I am a part of it just like thousands of other researchers and scientists all over the world. The reason I picked this, and Swami Sarvapriyananda is an expert here, the whole concept of who are you, where are you going, why do you do things, is being led bare by having AI and computers do things that humans could and humans do. So if machines can do what humans can do, then what remains? That's one of the big questions, and I think uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji Maharaj, uh, in his very elegant way, uh, touched on that. So for you students, I know you have to take exams, you have to study very hard, you have to become a doctor, an engineer, uh, a software scientist, uh, go work for big companies, earn big money. I'm not going to tell you anything about that. That's the process that, you know, is happening here. But what I want to highlight today are the existential challenges of the time. The challenges that you will not be able to avoid. That being a doctor, scoring the highest grades in your exam would not prepare you to answer. You have to experience you have to be out there, and it's better for you if you start thinking. I know your parents might not like me and come and say, sure, sure, you're trying to spoil my kids and telling them not to study for exams, but keep this in mind. It's going to happen to you. So what are the existential challenges of the time? And where does Vidapit come in, and where can you contribute? So one big crisis is the climate crisis. The science is undeniable, and the implications are alarming. Can we use science and technology to the rescue? The same science and technology which burns fossil fuels and do mass extermination of animals? Can we turn this around? Well, you will have to work on the renewable and sustainable energy. That's a lot more important than getting good grades. You know, you have to get good grades, but that's only a means to the end. Then there is a carbon capture technology. Those are, these are the technologies of the future. But even if I solve this, even if you solve this problem, there is free energy everywhere. There is a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is, our economic system has a serious, serious problem. It's driven by greed, plain and simple, unvarnished greed. There is no economic model right now, nor that there ever was, of a sustainable means of production where eight billion strong and growing number of humans can live and enjoy life. You know, what this economy, capitalism, which is the most successful form of economy that we know, we tried with other isms, and they failed uh, much more miserably than capitalism did, but you'll soon learn a term called pyramid scheme or the Ponzi scheme. So you're always borrowing from the future. You know, and how are you borrowing from the future? You produce more and more young people. 
in order to feed the rest, you need to produce equal number of new people. And that's the law that leads to an exponential growth. 5% compounded growth year on year. We, as a nation, we, as a society, where is our scheme? Where is our model? We follow the international monetary funds, the World Bank, uh, the, you know, the big uh, economies of the world. Do we have an answer? You know, that's something that, again, you won't be able to avoid it in your lifetimes. So the responsibility that will reside on your shoulders is a lot bigger than the responsibilities that rested on our shoulders uh, back when we were students. Now, people say, okay, fine. We're going to build robots, right? Then what would humans do? How do they get paid? Maybe for the first time, all humans will have enough things just to be a human. How do you reward someone? What is the alternative economic paradigm, right? A framework to pay someone. Basic pay, maybe? You know, are we there yet? So these are questions. You know, and these are very existential questions. But a bigger one is the moral crisis. As we speak, 90% of any animal that you can see, right, have been made reduced in number almost to the point of extinction. And you know why? That's because of human supremacy feeling. That the whole world, everything in this world is for our enjoyment. The other animals don't matter. We are going to grow animals, only those animals which benefit us, which we can feed on. The rest of the animals kill their habitat. People are talking about it. Now this is where I think you are going to grow up and play a huge role. Because this does not need a new scientific advance. No scientific advance is going to solve this problem. You know, it's a matter of changing our habits. Stop eating meat. You know, if you currently say stop eating meat, it's just not going to happen. People are going to keep on eating meat. How do you provide an infrastructure where 95% of the food that we grow goes to feeding the animals that we eat? And I'm not kidding. 95% of the food we produce, for which we clear lands and cut down Amazon, right? Uh, cut down all the habitats of other animals, 95% of that production goes to feeding the cattle, the pigs, the chickens, you know, that we all consume. Just not sustainable. And this has a solution. It's not rocket science solution. It's a solution based on a new way of thinking. And we are being irresponsible. We have been kind of walking like a zombie, right? Not caring about these things. But the whole thing has come home to roost. You know, now everybody is talking about it. Nobody knows how or whether, what to do. Have we passed that tipping point that there is no return, that there will be calamities, and from 8 billion, we have to be 1 billion people? Maybe Mother Nature doesn't care, right? But that would mean huge amount of suffering, huge amount of upheavals, wars, famines, atrocities of the kind that we have never seen before. You know, and 
maybe even we are going to witness it, definitely the kids sitting there, you are going to witness it. There's no other way around. And that's also okay, we know, right? So having told you about the, all the problems, here the problems always create opportunities. From how you grow your food to how uh, you think about things. So I think uh, Swami Ji, uh, Sarva Priyanandaji Maharaj yesterday alluded to it. There's a big, huge crisis in science. So, see, science is another way of looking at cosmogony. That